to everybody. Thanks for being with us today for this uh, meeting, this conversation between uh, Sylvia Rossi and Samuel Fosso. I'd like to thank Paris Photo for having organized this conversation. And in particular, I would like to thank uh, the curator of Curiosa, who's asked me to moderate this conversation with these two artists. I will try to start the PowerPoint. My name is Clotilde Moret. I'm a curator at the European House of Photography, the MEP. I'm also a curator of the retrospective exhibition of Samuel Fosso's work, Samuel Fosso, who's with us today. And this exhibition has just opened. In fact, uh, Le Vernissage was yesterday. So if you want to come to the MEP, uh, please do so. Before beginning, I would like to tell you that we'll reserve 10 to 15 minutes uh, for a Q&A. So I'm going to introduce you, Samuel Fosso. Uh, you do uh, self-portraits for close to 50 years. So you embodied and continue to do real people, but also uh, fictional people. You started your career as a photographer as a studio photographer in Africa, in Bangui, in the Central African Republic, where you still live today, uh, also in Paris. You have been shown in many, many uh, prestigious uh, exhibitions, the Waters Collection in, at the Tate in New York and MoMA in New York, uh, sorry, Tate in London, and at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. A little less than two years ago, you uh, had an exhibition at the Quai Branly in Paris in 2019. There was a first monographic uh, work on your work at the Faven uh, editions called Self-Portrait. So we're very pleased to introduce the French version of this book that's available today. C'est infaisable. Sylvain uh, Rossi, you also have one foot in two countries, uh, between Italy, Modena, and uh, London where you studied. You started uh, your photographic work in 2016, and uh, your work is uh, dedicated to the story of your family. You also use a self-portrait to tell the story about your identity, and spe more specifically, the story of your parents who were Togolese. They left Togo shortly before your birth, and uh, photography is what makes it possible for you to establish a link between the past and the present. You have exhibited in many photography exhibitions at the National Portrait Gallery in London. That's uh, saying something, quite an accomplishment. And uh, you uh, were awarded the Prix Jean Talon in 2020. And your interpreter apologizes, but the background noise is so horrific that we can hardly do our job. So apologies in advance to those of us who are listening to us so, uh, we're very pleased to have you here. Here are two self-portraits. I'd like to start this conversation uh, with the studio space, because both of you uh, are um, fascinated by the aesthetics of the uh, portrait studio in West Africa, but in your work, you kind of revisit the studio space. So, starting with Sylvia, I'd like to ask you to talk about how you use this aesthetic uh, language and how you have uh, taken it on board in your own photographic work. Can you? Okay, beautiful, it works. Um, um, so I. Okay, come on. Okay. Okay, so I I started uh, working in the in the studio setting, inspired by um, images from my own family album. Um, so when um, when I started my studies in Italy, I um, I saw for the first time uh, an image by Samuel Fosso. Uh, one of my tutors was um, showing his work during a lecture. And um, I just, uh, it was the first time uh, that I saw um, how you could use self-portraiture in, uh, in photography as well. 
And, but those images that I saw from Samuel, they reminded me of something that I already seen before. Um, and then uh, I had a look in my family album and I, and I saw images that resemble the same settings as uh, you would see in Samuel images. And uh, so I, I just asked my mom and uh, I saw these images, I, I showed her and I, and I asked her, who took those images? Uh, like some famous photographer, like, do you know Samuel Foster? And she's like, no, I don't know it. Like, obviously, um, when we were younger, we would um, take images in, uh, in the studio because uh, not many people owned cameras. So um, families um, and friends would, uh, would meet at the church on Sunday and in wearing their best clothes and then they would go to the photographer's studio to, to have their portrait taken. And I just liked how formal this environment was and how the studio was a space to, to create something uh, that was different from, uh, from reality, a, a space where you could uh, create a different uh, identity for yourself through clothes and through, through different objects. So yeah, that's what this studio means to me, like a space for negotiating my, my own identity and reflect on, uh, on my origins and my family and, uh, yeah, anything beyond that. That's quite interesting because this uh, relationship to the uh, studio space as a... Uh, is something that we also have in Samuel's work. So we were talking about the traditional photo studio in West Africa. Samuel, when you started taking photos, you learned as a studio photographer. Here are two examples of professional photos that were done in your own studio in Bangui. It's a very unusual story and a highly interesting one because you start very early. In fact, you were only 13. So you were actually age 13 when you opened your first uh, photographic studio. Can you tell us a few words about your work? How did you think to stage the people who came to you to have their portraits taken? Oh, this is in uh, uh, Central African Republic. And that's where I started photography. But before that, I worked in, uh, as a, a tradesperson. I worked in a small cafe that had a little bit of store attached to it. And when I stopped that job, And that's when I had to start with photography. And that's because I had my uncle as a guardian. He was my guardian. And there was a house in which he had his own studio and he did uh, commercial photography. And uh, this appealed to me. So I decided to ask my uncle if I could learn how to take photos. Initially, he said no. He didn't want me uh, to take the photos. He wanted to keep me as somebody who made ladies' shoes. So I decided to go through his wife. to try to convince him to take me on and to teach me the trade of a photography. And that's how I came to learn photography and I learned the trade in five or six years and I opened my own studio and so I was no, no longer working for my uncle. And I went uh, uh, solo and then. So this was a national 
uh, studio. And we needed uh, a different backdrop than the usual curtain. So I asked a local painter to basically paint a, a fresco on the wall at the back of the studio. And, uh, and I call it the Photo Studio National, as you can see. The second uh, photograph that you see here was taken in 77. And that's when uh, the president became Emperor Bokassa. And after the uh, parade with the uh, baton twirlers, the royal guard that were in the parade were people who were actually from my neighborhood. And uh, the, I took photographs of them. So here you have the baton twirlers of the Imperial Guard and the, the guards from themselves. Du coup, le, le soir venu, quand vous aviez fini de travailler en tant que photographe de studio, vous regardiez vos pellicules, et si vous restez encore un peu de pellicules, vous vous mettiez en... So, then if you still had some uh, uh, film left after your formal uh, portraits, then you did your own work. So, the black and white picture, this is you, you're what, 15 or 16 on this uh, picture? So that's when you start doing uh, self-portraits where you experiment different aspects or facets of your personality. There are about 50 images altogether. What's really interesting is that, okay, here I've decided to put it in parallel with another uh, photo that you did in 97, and you were invited by Tati. Now, Tati, uh, for those who don't know, is a very uh, low-end... Uh, department store in Paris that for its 50th anniversary organized uh, two events, one at the uh, Museum of Decorative Arts of Paris and another event that was held in its main, its flagship store in Barbès and you were invited with two other artists to recreate uh, your own studio to, to take pictures of clients. So you decided to stage yourself actually on the venue, in the premise of the store, using the props and the accessories that were there in the store. So, in both these images, there's a use of your studio, but this is quite different because you're, here you're actually creating a character. Can you tell us about this image of this sort of a bourgeois lady? You said it all. After the first Africa Photography Fair in Bamako in Mali in 95, then in 98 we came to Paris. Uh, so these two other artists and myself, and we were asked to create a studio and th this to celebrate th the 50th anniversary of the Tati department store in Paris. So when we got here, we decided to create, recreate a studio. And I thought it was a bit strange that I was discovered through self-portraits. But I decided to ask the director who invited us. I told her I had, I've used myself as inspiration, and so what should I do? I don't know, can Tati uh, provide us with uh, props? And uh, I was told, of course, that Tati had the resources to do this. All I had to do was to say what I needed. I said, so first of all, I want to do color photography and not the self-portraits that I'm used to doing. And I asked for an opinion. I wanted to represent a bourgeois woman.
because I had heard, of course, the whole story of France before uh, the revolution. The French had suffered, and uh, I can make a parallel with Africa. The bourgeois class uh, left the poor uh, to suffer on their own. So I wanted it to represent a bourgeois woman because uh, I, basically I think that's what caused the revolution. So I said uh, I want to create the character of a bourgeois woman. So then I asked for opinions. I asked around. So if women have the means, how would they dress? And then I went on also uh, with a golfer and a Japanese sailor. As Sammy was saying, this is a series that has 11 different figures or characters. You've created uh, social archetypes, the bourgeois, the American emancipated woman, uh, the settlers in Africa, the businessman, the sailor, the golfer, and the rocker. Let's go back to Sylvia. These are more recent photos that you made. You uh, actually did these during the lockdown, and I found it especially interesting from the standpoint of the studio and how does one recreate a studio. You created, actually, a structure. Can you tell us something about how you imagined this space, how you designed it, where is it? This is a body of work that I that I realized during the um, the lockdown, and uh, um, is made to look back at a moment of time where I was living by myself in in the flat in my flat in London, which I had to leave at some point. And when I when I moved back to to live in my parents' house, I I wanted to reflect on that time that I spent by myself and. Uh, which is quite similar to the experience that many people had um, during lockdown. So I, I built this um, box. It looks a bit like a cube with three apertures uh, uh, through which you can look in the inside. And um, yeah, it's, um, it's meant to symbolize that time uh, that I spent there. I use different objects to, to recreate moments for example I don't know when I moved out of the house some of the images like that one uh, the series is um, uh, has more images than uh, than those but that one for example on the uh, right hand side uh, uh, plays on uh, constructing different uh, places in the scene where um, you see my body um, so using all the three apertures to to recreate a scene and yeah, it's um, it's a set that I built with my with the help of my father. Um, my father is a retired blacksmith, so he usually um, is usually very handy. So he helps me uh, build all of the sets that um, are in my images. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. So, um, come uh, come on a pull. As we saw through the previous photography, your relationship to photography is also connected to performance. You both uh, embody or represent characters. So starting with these um, images in 2019, when you replay or you recast a central character in your life, which is your mother, how do you prepare, how do you stage these photos, what do the props mean? How do you actually climb into another person's skin? They, um, so those images, they, they usually come from um, 
personal conversations that I have with my mother about her, her life before she migrated to Italy and also about the time, uh, the first years where she was uh, a young migrant in, uh, in the north of Italy. The, um, so the way I construct the images, I take um, certain specific elements uh, that help me build the story. For example, the image um, on the left-hand side where I'm uh, holding on my head uh, some uh, wooden sticks. Those sticks are called alo, and uh, people sell them in the market. They use them to just brush their teeth. And my mom, when she was really young, she, she used to sell alo in the morning. Um, she, was, she would walk around the neighborhood and shout the name of, uh, of the produce, uh, shout alo. And then uh, she would come home, uh, um, take a shower, bathe, and then uh, go to school with her school, school uniform. So I use different objects that symbolize, uh, um, for example, education, the books, and then you have the school uniform, which I got from uh, the market of Asigame in Lomé. And it's the same uniform that students uh, still wear today and the same that my mom would have worn. And, and yeah, I use the studio setting to kind of frame my images. So I guess it's a, um, it's a way of performing someone else. I'm performing in that image my mom before I met her. So when she was a young and a, and a young student. And... I guess I, I do have some problems uh, when people define my work as performance. And at first I wasn't, I wasn't too sure about it. But then, uh, yeah, after I had a conversation with someone, uh, um, yeah, I was kind of thinking about how my work, um, what, how performing is really having that privilege to create a different environment, so become a different person. But actually, um, when I look at myself, when I walk in the streets in Italy, for example, um, people assign a specific identity uh, to, to me. They look at me and they, they can say, oh, maybe she's a migrant. But then having, um, having the the chance in the studio to take on a different identity is, uh, yeah, is something that gives me a lot of freedom. Um, so I guess uh, instead of performance, I would say that my work is uh, an, an act of remembering something. And in this case, I'm remembering uh, my family history and I'm remembering uh, um, an action which is head carrying. So throughout the making of the project, I learned head carrying, which is something that... Yes, um, yeah. you made some video about it. Um, yeah. So I have the impression, normally it's a video, but yeah. là, maintenant, c'est une, une image. Mais uh, en réalité, il s'agit d'une vidéo où, Sylvia, tu montres... Yeah. Voilà. Pe Peut-être que tu peux en parler, justement. Uh, c'est une, une vidéo de quelques secondes où tu montres euh, avec des gestes comment créer un, un turban qui te permet de porter euh, des objets sur ta tête. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so in the video, I'm uh, learning and I'm performing something. Um, so learning head caring that I should have learned from a really young age, uh, like my mom when she was really young. But then I'm learning it now through photography, so using photography as a way of remembering um, a family history that was lost in, in the process of migration. As you know, many, many women in my family, they work in, uh, in markets still today. So this is something, a part of my history that was lost, but I'm trying to um, regain it in a way. Oui, j'avais lu dans une interview que tu expliquais que normalement ce sont des gestes que les parents apprennent aux enfants quand ils sont très jeunes au Togo, mais que toi finalement tu as demandé à ta mère de t'apprendre cette technique quand tu étais adulte et finalement via la photographie tu as, tu as, tu as appris cette technique. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly that process of, uh, 
of learning something that um, was going to get lost. So um, in a way, photography and video are a way of preserving uh, a certain knowledge, a sort of like ancestral um, knowledge. Alors, quand tout à l'heure, Samuel... Samuel was talking about Tati and the image, uh, uh, the chief who gave Africa back to the settlers uh, that he did uh, for the 50th anniversary of Tati. So you are this character in the photograph, but then you were invited to actually perform this during other exhibitions. Yes, I was invited uh, for the year of African photography in the UK. So I was in London and it was for a live exhibition. So first, the exhibition was in the museum, and then one of the major uh, underground stations in London. In London. Ah, vous étiez à Selfridge. You were. Oh, you were at Selfridges. That's where you were. And so I posed for the performance as I was, and I had to not move at all for an hour while people walked past and they thought, maybe this is a sculpture, an object. So here I'm sitting actually in, in uh, the storefront and I'm posing for one hour and people looking through uh, the storefront were puzzled. They didn't know if it was an object or a person. And this was in 2004 in London. How do you prepare yourself? How do you get ready for something like this, to take a photo like this? Or what's the difference, rather, between preparing for a photo and preparing for a live performance? Do you approach it differently? Do you're in a different uh, state of mind when you're taking a picture or performance? Well, this is different. Here, I don't need any state of mind. Here, the only thing I have to concentrate on is not moving and maybe only allow my eyes to move. It was a challenge and I wanted to see if I could do it. So if I prepare for a photo, photograph is totally different. Yeah, then you have to step into a certain state of mind, into uh, the, the skin, so to speak, of the character you're trying to embody or to represent it. It's a, it requires a, a kind of meditation. And of course, you have to prepare all of your settings. But, and you have to sort of uh, meditate yourself into uh, the character that you're creating. And I always have uh, my uh, trigger to take the picture in my hand. You see, actually, on your photographs, as we do on Sylvia's photographs, that you, you have the remote uh, uh, device to take the picture. You said uh, that doing a performance is different when I'm uh, representing a character. It's almost spiritual. I have to have some kind of a relationship with the character that I'm embodying. As you're talking about uh, the spiritual side and 
the way with your body you're actually embodying some real historical characters. Maybe you should, can talk about the series African Spirit that you did in 2008. And here you embody 14 uh, major figures in the Pan-African movement and in the civil rights movement. So how do you get into the skin? How do you walk into the skin of Malcolm X? Okay, how do you get into the skin of Malcolm X? First, you start with the props. His hat, his suit, his tie, and the wash. And the rest is what I do. So I, I put the clothes on and I look at myself. And I look at whether the props are exactly the ones that he had. Then there's second uh, phase to try to adopt the position that he held when he, his photo was taken. And of course I have my device uh, in my hand ready and I try then to enter into his mind, into his spirit. I have to feel what he felt And when I feel that I getting there, okay. If you're sitting next to me, I can't know you totally, and your interpreter is apologizing, but Samuel is moving his microphone around. And then I take several pictures, and then I see whether it's turned out well or not. Samir was talking about how carefully he selects the props and the clothing. Sylvia, you said that you were embodying the uh, character of your mother or a young schoolgirl. And is it very important to be very uh, faithful to the story that you're telling in the props and the clothes? Um, so the way I create the images, I, I look at many images where my parents appear and in particular images where my parents were already in Italy. So I study those images and I study the poses and how they look in them and then when I'm in the studio I try to replicate um, what uh, their movements might have been. Um, the clothes and everything that I wear is not, is not actually original. It doesn't come from uh, um, my family home or anything. It's just clothes that I find and they, they resemble something that my mom could have worn or um, anything like that. And the, and the objects as well. In, in the case of my, of my images where I dress as my father, I, I never actually met him, so every element about him is um, coming from conversations with my mom. So all the informations are from my mother. So all the stories that I tell are very much from a female point of view and, perspe and perspective. And yeah, I guess I use the, um, the objects in the same way as... Uh, in West African uh, or Central African studio portraiture. Um, but also, I use them in a slightly different way. For example, there's an image where I'm dressed like my mother and I'm wearing, I'm, uh, I have a radio on my head. And, you know, usually the radio is, um, is something that is used to um, symbolize, um, you know, party and... Uh, Um, music and uh, you know you, you would pose with the radio and send an image to to your family to to show you know you're having fun and you're young and 
and everything is great. But then uh, in the image, I use it because um, it's related to a story. So my mom heard on the radio that um, they were going to pass in Italy this law that would uh, um, allow um, migrants to get papers to stay there if they arrived in Italy before the, the 1990s. So the radio in my image becomes uh, a symbol of freedom, of movement, and, and that's how I use it in the work. Yeah. Et dans certaines de tes vidéos, tu fais participer ta mère et ta grand-mère également. Et du coup, quel est leur regard par rapport à, au travail que tu portes justement sur euh, ta relation à l'exil euh, et à, à tes racines togolaises ah, je ne pas compris la ah, question. Comment, comment ta mère et ta grand-mère perçoivent ton travail et ta, ta, ton questionnement autour de ton, de ton identité togolaise um, So you're asking in what way my, my family perceives the work Ok. Um, I guess for, for my family and for me, the work is, a, is an opportunity to have conversations that we, we never had before, um, to investigate the past and uh, to, to share um, conversation that we wouldn't normally have. We, I wouldn't normally sit at the table and ask my mom about her past and about her life and her youth, but then photography becomes an excuse to Um, to have those conversations. So I guess my, yeah, my family is happy about the work. Like my mom came to um, an exhibition that I had in London and uh, uh, she said to me that she's happy that someone in the family is telling and is passing on uh, um, her story. So yeah, I guess it's all positive. Merci, <laughs> Sylvia. Um. Justement sur la, la relation à, à l'histoire familiale. On the topic of the relationship to family history, there's a series of photographs, the dream of my grandfather, and this tells uh, the story of the relationship uh, to your grandfather. He was an Igbo traditional medicine man. He wanted you to become Uh, the village chief. Uh, you did not because you became a photographer and in 2004 you created this series. So is the image the way in a spiritual way to carry out the wish that your grandfather had for you? Can you say something about these images? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Yes, uh, uh, the dream of my grandfather is the name of this photograph. It's a long story. My grandfather was responsible for me. I was born uh, paralyzed. tetraplegic. In Cameroon, they tried to heal me, and uh, with modern medicine, uh, nothing was possible. So I was uh, brought back to Nigeria to see if uh, some of the traditional medicine men could heal me. And my grandfather was not only the village chief, but he was also uh, a, a leading medicine man. And so my mother explained to him what the problem was. And he answers that he was not the force, but that there were two things that had to be done. If it was really a disease from the hand of God, then it would be impossible to be cured But if it had to do with jealousy, if it was because if uh, some uh, amulets were used uh, to create this disease, then it wouldn't be possible to cure it, and uh, that it was necessary to 
go and see all of the medicine men in the village together. They all together decided that this was not the hand of God, it was the hand of man that was responsible. And my grandfather said, he will be cured of this illness, and indeed I was. First of all, I was his firstborn grandson, and when I was cured, he did not want to let me leave with my mother. While we were there, at my grandfather's, I was five or six years old. But there was the war in Biafra that started then. So I stayed with my grandfather and my grandmother during the Biafra war, living in the, in the bush. And my grandfather decided I should be his heir and that I should stay in the village, that I should take his place and take on his powers. But unfortunately, at the end of the war, 1970, when we were able to go back, he had died. Whereas my uncle, who was in Cameroon, learned that we had not died. And he rea was reassured that he'd seen my mother. In other words, they thought that we had died in the intervening period. So we got a letter that my grandmother had written. And uh, so this uncle came to Nigeria. They he saw the conditions which we were living. And he asked to, to bring me back to Cameroon. Because my grandfather had died and he did not want for me to move. Uh, the permission was given. So my grandfather had dreamed that, that I would become these things, but that was not possible. As we say, uh, God disposes. And I was not able to carry on the tradition of my grandfather, and that's how I went to Cameroon. But when I became an artist, and a foundation gave me funding, I decided to carry out the dream of my grandfather. And that's why I call this uh, the dream of my grandfather, because I was paying tribute to, to everything that he did that allowed me to stay alive. draw this to a close so we'll allow a little bit of time for some questions. I would like to finish with a series of image, one of the last series by Samuel uh, done in 2015-2016 that was uh, done over the course of five or six weeks. It's a series of self-portraits. They are very different from what uh, Samuel did before. And this series, you're uh, toying or playing with the different emotions that humans can feel in their lifetime. Yes, emotions. Each individual changes. As, as the light of day changes. As I was talking about the word in Biafra earlier, God, and my childhood, once I left and went to the Central African Republic, and even there, the war pursued me because some of you may know what happened in the uh, Central African Republic in 2014. And that's where I started the photography. And I'm still here today.
in 2014, basically, I was a survivor of those events. And before that, I think even in France, in 2013, uh, I was invited to Paris Photo, and I went back to my hotel that was called, uh, it was a Campanile. in the center of Paris and I and I got back to my hotel about one in the morning and my agent called me at two thirty in the morning and he said, Samuel, did you get home all right? And I said, Yes. He said, because there was an attack, there are people who died and I thought maybe you were a victim. And that's when I watched television and I saw what had happened. So in 93, 94, there was uh, uh, the same kind of events. So from the time I was born until then, I seem to have been pursued by these kinds of events. Before that, I was in New Delhi. And during the, my exhibition, there was also a terrorist attack in Bombay. So I've been chased or pursued by uh, happiness and misfortune, good fortune and misfortune. In Réunion, I was told 30 years now. Samuel is talking out of, oh, too far from his microphone. So I thought that Six six six. This is uh, the number of the devil in the Bible. All of these obstacles that I overcame and I survived. So to produce this, okay. I just look at life as it is, and I think that life is. Uh, always comes in pairs, women and men, heaven and earth, day and night. All of this is mixed together. So I look at life for what it has to offer in, in the best and in the worst, happy and unhappy. I have to adapt to life as it comes because nobody's safe in their life. So again, I come back to the figure 666, the number of the devil. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Silvio. Thanks for listening to us. Do you have any questions from the audience? If so, we're here, we're ready.